Wait, we gotta talk about this because now you gotta write, right? Oh, I do gotta write. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. <laughs> so we're gonna try something, and I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna work this out because we've changed how we're gonna do this a couple of times. We were both gonna do this in front of you all, and then I, I don't know. Are we ever gonna be on stage together? I don't know. I don't know how it's gonna happen. But yeah, I think we should read them on stage together. Okay, that's what we did. <laughs> so, um, I used to live in the Bay. I'm enjoying this. Uh, I used to live in the Bay Area, and out there I met, uh, I played uh, football or, or soccer with a, a young writer named Daniel Alarcon, who's from Lima, Peru. He's a great writer. He's got a couple of books out uh, Lost City Radio uh, and War by Candlelight, um, which is a collection of short stories. He writes in English, so if anybody's interested, check him out. Daniel Alarcon. But, um, he recently uh, got interviewed, I think, in New York Times or something, and um, he was talking about Lima, Peru, where he's from, about how there's kind of this black market of books and what that means, both pros and cons for writers and the literary scene and stuff. And then he was talking about this thing that I thought was very fascinating. There's this phenomenon in Lima, Peru called Lucha Libre. How many of you ever heard of Lucha Libre? What's Lucha Libre? Anybody know? Free fight. It's, yeah, literally translated, it's, it's a free ride or a free, not free ride, uh, that's what we're about to do. Uh, a free fight or a, a free struggle uh, would be the literal translation. Lucha Libre is Latin America and particularly Mexico's version of wrestling, right? You know, you've seen the WWE or WWF wrestling and uh, perhaps you've seen a uh, character named Rey Mysterio who comes out, he's from San Diego and he's all proud of his Mexican heritage and he has this mask that he puts on and stuff. Um, you know, a lot of these wrestlers take on these personas. So, that's, in, in Mexico, actually there's a really interesting documentary if you ever want to watch it on PBS, you can go to pbs.org, it's called The Masked Men, it's a history of this Lucha Libre which has been around since like the 30s or something, and it's a very sort of working class kind of thing, much as it is here in the United States. Um, you know, a lot of macho stuff and whatnot. But, um, so Lucha Libre has this kind of very Mexican connotation to it, uh, and Latin American as well, and women sometimes do it, but it's mostly men. But down there they do Lucha Libre, which is where two writers will get up on stage, and they'll do, they'll write. It's almost like a writing competition on the spot, like a free write competition. And they're battling each other for the best written piece or something. And created on the spot, Lucha Libro. Um, so we wanted to attempt to do something like that. It's a little less competitive because Jessica is more competitive than I am. But um, <laughs> we thought that we wanted to maybe take some words or themes from the audience and um, try to write a piece then on the spot, incorporating some of these things, right? Is that yeah. what we're going to do? I need to, oh, I got paper right here. So, uh, let me do this. I'm going to call people out, okay? And I want you to give me a word or a phrase, first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, Mom, what you got? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God, there you go. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I'm going to incorporate that one into mine. It was gosh. Hi. It was gosh? Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, it, was gosh. oh my gosh. it was oh my gosh. It helps. Uh, okay, let's see. Rob, what you got? Chameleon. Chameleon. I don't even know how to spell chameleon. C A H A M. M A L L C H A M. Chameleon? Yes. Yeah. Alright, that's somebody's name. Chameleon. <laughs> Uh, let's see, who else? Lisa, what do you got? Uh, feisty. Feisty. Feisty chameleon named Oh My Gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> are we doing haikus or are we doing Um, no, just a short free write. Uh, who else? Papa, what do you got? The Impossible Dream. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> impossible Dream. Let's get... Let's get two more, yeah? Uh, Curtis, what do you got? Procrastination. Procrastination. <laughs> Pro, crass. Can, can I do that? Can I say pro and crass? And then tin and nation? Procrastination. I got four words out of you. 
Uh, today, so what you got? Repair. Repair. Hmm. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I am going to read a poem while Jessica writes, and then you're going to read a poem while I write, and then we'll do our poems. We'll battle it out. We'll battle it out, right? Because I know we're getting close to time, yeah? Right. Okay, so we'll be quick because we want to get to open mic. People are going to read poems, right? I love haikus. Everybody write a haiku and read it then when we're done. Okay, here we go. Um, let me find a poem. Any nominees? No, that's what I was saying. You want someone to read a poem? No, I got it. I got it right here. I got it right here. Um, this one is called No Dogs or Mexicans Allowed. Uh, this is about three generations of family history and how when the pressure to assimilate, to surrender your culture, comes from within the family, it's, it's the most difficult to confront. It's called No Dogs or Mexicans Allowed. The year is 1953, just outside New Brownfields, Texas. Population 12,200, an overwhelmingly German town just off the migrant trail at the confluence of Los Rios Comal y Guadalupe. Smack dab in the middle of Tejas Lan, the sign in the saloon's window reads, No dogs or Mexicans allowed. As they sit in their new used 1940 Chrysler Windsor, held together by and kept running by curses, prayers to La Virgen and the internal organs of at least three other cars, the sweltering Texas heat bakes and boils everything under its unrelenting gaze, and their three young children, Linda, Olga, and Tony Jr., cry from the back seat, cry from overheating, cry from hunger, cry from frustration, cry because there is nothing better to do when you are a Mexican sitting in a rundown 1940 Chrysler Windsor outside of a saloon in New Brownfields, Texas in 1953. Luz Maria is thirsty. Perhaps it is El Calor. Perhaps it is the disgusted glares of restaurant patrons as they spill out with alcoholic anger into Germantown, USA. She thirsts for something, anything. Lula, don't go causing trouble, he says to her. Antonio's voice is moonlighting as a teatro actor playing a macho esposo. Tu sabes que no nos permiten aquí. And as an aside, y el pinche policía es un cabrón. He knows. He has been Mexican all his life. She, not when she was born in Puerto Rico some 20 years earlier, not when she came to the U.S. at age 6, 15 to clean houses for middle-class white families, she <coughs> only became Mexican when she married him without apology. Before the dust kicked up from the opening and closing of the car door can settle, she is inside. He waits, the babies cry. We don't serve your kind here. No sirve mexicanos, comprendo? And she understands, but not because she heard him. The room is dim and smoky. She is a woman amongst men, working class, white, inebriated, perplexed, amused, irate, their eyes a mob of torches, shotguns, and blades. Hers, a Caribbean hurricane. She is thirsty, yet she has come to bring the rain. I'm not Mexican, I'm Puerto Rican, and I want a glass of water. <laughs> It was the best damn vaso de agua she'd ever had, but it could not quench her thirst. The year is 1961, Fort Wayne, Indiana, population 125,000, where the Maumee, St. Joseph, and St. Mary's Rivers meet. The family moved here when the oldest hija turned old enough to go to school. Lula told Antonio that the migrant trail was no place to raise babies and her kids were going to get an education. It is the first day of the school year, first grade, St. Peter's Catholic School. The other kids all filed in sparkly, prim, and proper in pleated skirts and starch shirts fresh from the Sears catalog. But seven-year-old Felix, whose mother pronounces his name Feli, Puerto Rican style with a silent S, Feli tries to blend in with the off-white of the walls in his hand-me-down trousers with faded knees and his off-white shirt, which Later, he will get in trouble for, for not being white enough, and which, because his older brother was never his bigger brother, strains to an unrelaxing tautness on his deep brown skin, which has always gotten him in trouble for not being white enough. 
Failey knows the classroom like it was his abuelita's house because he was here last year, didn't learn to speak English, struggled and stuttered over foreign words until he just learned to no decir nada, roll over and play deaf so they held him back, had not mastered the master's tongue so the headmistress flunked him because there are no dogs or Mexicans allowed. The year is 1973, one year after Felix graduated high school. He was a football star at Central Catholic Fighting Irish, captain of his team two years, all city three years, city champs his senior year, but no college scholarships because his grades don't cut it. Has a chance at semi-pro ball, but marries his high school sweetheart instead. Irish, smart and radiant with jet black hair and pearl white skin, they have a baby on the way. He lands a job at one of the local factories, the one where his father works making truck axles. He puts in a lot of overtime. On Sundays, watches football on TV. The year is 1980, still Fort Wayne, Indiana, second day of school, St. John the Baptist Catholic School. I go to the wrong first grade classroom. The teacher asks me if I am the new boy, and yes, I most definitely am. The sea of white faces looks just like the sea I navigated yesterday. Already I am lost, out of place. I enroll in speech therapy because the teacher says I can't enunciate my S's or Z's. My name is Manny Ortez. My mother gave me that name, but the other kids call me Taco. The year is 2001, a long distance phone call to Fort Wayne from the Twin Cities. Population 1.25 million where the Mississippi matures far from spilling into the Gulf of Mexico. My abuelita's voice answered, weary and weak. Como ta mija, I ask. A term of endearment we grandchildren had co-opted from her. She called us all mijo or mija when she wasn't calling us que cabrón. <laughs> she reprimands me in English. It's not como esta, como ta, it's como estas. It's the only Spanish she speaks to me. My father even less. He knows the word poño, but not how to use it. He has forgotten, like he has forgotten a lot of things. In my abuelo's voice, he scolds me. Don't go messing with those people down there. That's none of your business. And his agitated words burrow their way into the self-doubting parts of me. But Pops, they've asked us to come. There's a war going on down there. I know it is useless, but I try. I try in simple words. English words, words I need him to understand, without words like raza, chicano, or sangre, low-intensity warfare, indígena, neoliberalism, without apology. I know it is useless, but I try. The year is 2001. It is a long, long-distance phone call, population two, and the tone in my father's voice reads, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.